During the Sinai Offensive, launched at 0800 hours on June 5th, 1967, the M50s and M51s played a marginal role in the first but crucial actions against Egyptian tanks in northern Sinai. Israeli Patton's and Centurions advanced hundreds of kilometers into the Sinai Desert, disorganizing Egyptian troops and creating major logistical problems for the Israeli army. One of the most important actions was carried out by more than 60 Shermans of the 14th Armored Brigade, which, together with about 60 other Mark V Centurions of the 63rd Armored Battalion and the Mechanized Reconnaissance Division Battalion, that had an unknown but limited number of AMX 13s. These 150 tanks attacked the Abu Aguila stronghold, which controlled the road to Ismailia. The Egyptian defenses consisted of three lines of trenches, five kilometers long and almost one kilometer apart. They were defended by 8,000 soldiers and many hull down tank positions that were not actually used. Soviet 130mm cannons providing support for the fortifications were stationed at Umm Katif, a nearby hill, and the Egyptian reserves at the rear which were ready for action, including an armored regiment of 66 t 3485s and a battalion with 22 SD-100s or SU-100Ms. There were two versions of the SU-100 Soviet tank destroyer in Egyptian service. The first was produced under license in Czechoslovakia after World War II, and the second was a version modified by the Egyptians to more efficiently adapt the SD-100 and SU-100 to desert operations. The Israeli attack, planned long before because the defenses in the region were well known to the Israeli general staff, was launched on the night between the 5th and 6th of June, in order to use the cover of darkness. Number 124 Paratrooper Squadron was taken to the vicinity of Umm Katif Hill by helicopters and attacked and destroyed the 130mm cannons. The Shermans of the 14th Armored Brigade advanced hidden and covered by artillery barrage fire and darkness. They struck the Egyptian trenches. Throughout the night, the infantry, supported by M3 half-tracks, cleared the trenches while the Shermans, after breaking through the trenches, supported the Centurions which had circumvented the Egyptian positions by intercepting the reserves advancing for a counter-attack. During the battle between the tanks, fought between 400 and 700 hours, the Egyptians lost more than 60 tanks, while the Israelis only lost 19, 8 during the battle and 11 Centurions damaged in the minefields, resulting in the deaths of only 7 tank crewmen and 42 soldiers during the attack. The Egyptians had claimed a total of 2,000 losses. When the Egyptian Army High Command learned of the defeat at Abu Aguila, Egyptian Field Marshal Mohamed Amer ordered his soldiers to retreat to Gidi and Mitla, two strongholds just 30 kilometers from the Suez Canal. The Egyptian units that received the order withdrew in a disorganized manner to Suez often abandoning weapons, artillery, or tanks in their defensive positions. On the afternoon of 6 June, Algeria sent military aid to Egypt, including MiG fighters and tanks, so the general retreat order was cancelled. This created even more confusion among the troops, which, except in rare cases, were demoralized and continued their withdrawal to Suez. Sensing the situation, the Israeli High Command ordered its units to block enemy access to the Suez Canal by trapping most of the Egyptian army with its equipment in the Sinai. This strategy would allow the capture of hundreds of tanks, artillery pieces, and thousands of weapons, which would economically burden the Egyptian army for years to come. Due to the rapid advance of the first three days, many Israeli tanks were left with little fuel and ammunition, which is why most Israeli armored units were forced to wait for supplies, and they could not move immediately to the canal. To give an idea of the problem of the lack of fuel, the IDF in the Sinai had a total of 700 tanks. However, the road to Ismailia was blocked by only 12 centurions of the 31st Armored Division, 
the unit had at least another 35 centurions with empty fuel tanks. Of these 12 tanks, some ran out of fuel during the march and the other crews were forced to tow them to the predetermined place to block the road. Another example is Lieutenant Colonel Zev Eitan, commander of the 19th Light Tank Battalion equipped with AMX 1375 light tanks. Since his vehicles were the only ones in the area with full tanks and ammunition supply, he was given the task of stopping an enemy attack with his light reconnaissance tanks. Eitan left with 15 AMX 13s and positioned himself on the dunes near Bir Girgafa, waiting for the enemy. The Egyptians counterattacked with 50 or 60 T-54 and T-55 tanks, forcing the AMX 13s to retreat after suffering many losses, mainly because of the explosion of an M3 half-track carrying ammunition and fuel for the AMX 13 battalion. They did not destroy a single Egyptian tank. The 19th Light Tank Battalion, however, slowed down the Egyptians long enough to allow some M50s and M51s of the 14th Armored Brigade to refuel and intervene in the area. These, by hitting the Egyptian tanks on their sides, managed to destroy many of them, forcing the others to retreat to Ismailia. The Egyptian counterattack then ran into the 12 centurions of the 31st Armored Division, which totally wiped them out. During the late afternoon of June 6, the Israeli 200th Armored Brigade attacked the Egyptian positions in the center of the Sinai Peninsula. Their task was to conquer the Jebel Libni Air Base, previously rendered unusable by Israeli Air Force bombardments. This base was defended by the Egyptian 141st Armored Brigade and the elite palace guards of the Egyptian army, the latter armed with modern T-55s. The Egyptians began firing as soon as they sighted the Israeli tanks, but their crews were not trained in long-range shooting, and so the result was only to alarm the Israeli crews. These, being better trained, opened fire and started hitting the Egyptian tanks. However, the distance at which the two forces faced each other was large, and the Israeli shells bounced off the well-inclined armor of the T-55s, forcing the Israelis to get closer to be able to penetrate the armor. The 200th Armored Brigade, supported by the 7th Armored Brigade and having the advantage of darkness, began the approach and the circumvention of the Egyptian stronghold. During the night, the battle continued furiously. In the end, 30 Egyptian tanks remained on fire in their positions, while the survivors fled west. In the Sinai, before the war, the Egyptian army had about 950 tanks of various models, ranging from the modern T-55 to the obsolete T-34. During the fighting, they lost over 700 tanks, a hundred of which were captured intact by the Israelis, as well as an unknown number that were repaired and put into service in the IDF in the following months as Tirans. The Israelis lost 122 tanks, about a third of which were recovered and repaired after the war. For the Jordan Offensive, the 10th Harel Mechanized Brigade, led by Colonel Uri Ben Ari, attacked the hills north of Jerusalem on the afternoon of June 5, 1967. Composed of five tank companies instead of the free standard ones, the 10th Brigade had 80 tanks, of which 48 Shermans, most of them being M50s, 16 Panad AMLs, and 16 Centurion Mark Vs armed with the old 20-pounder cannons. The narrow mountain roads and mines scattered everywhere slowed down the advance of the motorized brigade. The sappers and tanks of the unit were not equipped with mine detectors because they were all supplied to the units fighting in the Sinai. To detect the mines, the Israeli soldiers had to probe the ground for hours with bayonets and individual weapons. In just a few hours, the commander's M3 half-track and seven Shermans were disabled by mines. None of the vehicles were fully lost because, after the offensive, they were recovered and repaired. Another huge obstacle was advancing in the dark. During the night, all 16 centurions got stuck in the rocks or damaged their tracks by hitting the rocks of the mountain roads and could not be repaired or helped because of Jordanian artillery fire. The first noteworthy action that night was an assault by Israeli mechanized infantry that destroyed the Jordanian artillery, 
allowing repairs to begin in daylight the following morning. Only six Shermans, some M3 half-tracks and some Panard AML armored vehicles arrived at their destination the following morning, but were immediately greeted by Jordanian fire. Two Jordanian armored companies had arrived during the night, equipped with M48 patterns and had positioned themselves to maintain their position. A Sherman was immediately knocked out by 90mm cannon fire. The remaining Shermans circumvented the Jordanian patterns, hitting them in the outer fuel tanks or flanks, knocking out six in minutes. The Jordanian tanks that survived the battle retreated to Jericho, abandoning 11 more M48s along the way due to mechanical failure. Further north, in the border town of Janin, the Jordanians had prepared a defense with 44 M47 pattern tanks, and further inland, was the 40th Armored Brigade placed in reserve with the M47 and M48 pattern tanks. The Ugda Brigade, equipped with 48 M50 and M51s, was given the primary task of destroying the Jordanian artillery in the sector, which was hitting a nearby military airport from which air raids against Jordan had been carried out and destroyed forces in the town of Janin. The Israeli unit advanced rapidly during the day, putting the crews of the Jordanian 155mm Howitzer Long Toms on the run. The first problems were encountered in the evening. Most of the vehicles ended up in narrow mountain roads and were forced to wait for the light of day to continue the advance. Six or seven M50s and M51s climbed Burkim Hill. On the night between June 5th and June 6th, while advancing among the olive groves, the platoon commander, Lieutenant Motke, saw something move ahead in the darkness of the night. Turning on the spot lamp mounted above his Sherman's cannon, his platoon was amazed to find themselves face to face with an entire Jordanian armored company armed with M47 patterns less than 50 meters away. The Israeli tanks opened fire on the Jordanian forces which were also stunned destroying more than a dozen tanks for the loss of just one M50 and no Israeli tank crew losses. The fighting in the area was very furious for the rest of the campaign. The Jordanians stubbornly resisted the Israeli advance by launching several ill-organized counterattacks which were all repulsed by the idea of tanks. Although the 90mm cannons of the M47 and M48 patterns were very effective against the arm of the Shermans at any distance, the crews were not well trained, especially in long distance shooting. The Israelis, in addition to superior training, could count on almost unlimited air support, which proved to be very effective both day and night. Between 9th and 10th of June, the commander of the 40th Jordanian Armored Brigade, Rakan Anad, staged a counter attack with the aim of targeting Israeli refueling vehicles that carried fuel and ammunition to the tanks on the front lines. Initially, the attack was launched in two directions in order to confuse the Israelis. This was quite successful, succeeding in destroying some M3 half-tracks and trucks that were going to the front line to supply the Israeli tanks. The Israelis, however, managed to intercept and stop Anad's counter-attack, starting a clash between the Israeli Shermans and Jordanian patterns that lasted several hours. A small force made up of AMX-13s, 12th century and Mark V's and some M51's of the 37th Israeli Armored Brigade went up a very narrow road and attacked the rear of the enemy by surprise. In addition to some patterns, this force also hit several vehicles that brought supplies to the Jordanian tanks. Commander Anad, along with his forces, was forced to retire due to the lack of ammunition and fuel without being able to attempt further attacks abandoning another 35 M48 patterns and an unknown number of M47s on the battlefield. Due to political problems, ground attacks against Syria were not immediately authorized by Defense Minister Moshe Dayan. However, the 8th Armored Brigade, commanded by General Albert Mendler and including 33 Shermans, which should have been deployed to the Sinai, was sent to the border ready for battle. In the following days, a company of Shermans of the 37th Armored Brigade and another of the 45th Armored Brigade also arrived in the area. Other Shermans were split into the 1st Galani Infantry Brigade, the 2nd Infantry Brigade and the 3rd Infantry Brigade ready for battle. After pressure from the villagers who lived in the area, tired of periodic Syrian bombing, 
After a whole night of reflection, at 1600 hours on Friday, June 9th, 1967, the commander of the Israeli forces at the border with Syria, Brigadier General David Dado El Azar, received a telephone call from Dayan authorizing the attack on the Golan Heights. From 600 to 1100 hours, the Israeli Air Force continually bombed Syrian positions as army sappers cleared the streets. Their operations were facilitated because, in the weeks before, heavy rains had dug out the Syrian mines. The advance of Israeli armored vehicles, mainly M50s, M51s, and M3 half tracks, began at 11.30 hours. Hundreds of armored vehicles made their way behind a civilian bulldozer under the incessant fire of automatic weapons of the Syrian army. Strangely, the Syrian artillery, which had periodically struck Israeli villages near the border for years, did not fire a single shot to hinder the Israeli advance, preferring to continue bombing the kibbutzim, the Hebrew settlements. At the top of the road, at the crossroads, the forces of Colonel Ari Ebiro, commander of the column, split. Divided into two columns, they attacked the stronghold of Kala, a hill with 360-degree defenses with bunker and anti-tank guns of Second World War Soviet origin. Six kilometers north, the Zaoura stronghold, another defensive hill, supported Kala with its artillery fire blocking Israeli vehicles and not allowing Bureau's officers to see the battlefield. The situation confused several officers who, without clear information and unfamiliar with the terrain, advanced towards Zaura, convinced they were attacking Kala. The battle lasted over three hours and the information available is quite confusing as many Israeli officers died or were injured during the battle and were evacuated by medical personnel. Lieutenant Horowitz, the officer who commanded the assault on Kala continued to command while injured and with his M50's radio system destroyed by a Syrian shell. During the approach, he lost most of the Shermans under his command. Only about 20 of them remained effective when he arrived at the base of the hill. The ascent to the top was hindered by dragon's teeth, concrete anti-tank obstacles, and heavy anti-tank artillery fire, which at that distance was very precise. Of the approximately 20 Shermans, most were hit by anti-tank guns and knocked out, although most were recovered and repaired after the war. At 400 hours, the Zaura stronghold was occupied, while Kala was occupied only at 600 hours when it began to get dark. Only three Shermans and a few M3 half-tracks arrived at the top of the hill, including that of Horowitz. These easily overcame the barbed wire and the trenches, forcing Syrian soldiers to flee after throwing hand grenades from the turrets of their tanks into the trenches. An hour after Ari Ebiro's attack, the 1st Israeli Golani Infantry Brigade climbed the same road and attacked the Tel Azaziat and Tel Fakr emplacements that had hitherto hit the Israeli villages. Tel Azaziat was an isolated mound 140 meters above the border. There, four Syrian Panzerkampfwagen four tanks in a fixed position, delivered an ongoing fusillade into the Israeli plane below. The tank company of the 8th Armored Brigade, equipped with M50s and M51s, and the mechanized infantry company of the 51st Battalion, equipped with M3 half-tracks, attacked this position. They quickly managed to silence the cannons of the Syrian panzers. In doing so, and 22 years after the end of the Second World War, Shermans and Panzers were fighting each other once again, albeit in a very different context. The conquest of Tel Fakr was far harder. Five kilometers from the border, two companies attacked it with 9 M50s and 19 M3 half-tracks. Due to the intense artillery barrage being endured, they made a mistake on the road and instead of circumventing it, they ended up with all the vehicles in the center of the fortifications. In the middle of the minefields and under fire, all of their vehicles were soon destroyed, forcing the Israelis to attack the fortification with infantry alone. During the night, Israeli reinforcements arrived, consisting of the rest of the 37th Armored Brigade and the 45th Armored Brigade, armed with Sherman tanks and a few Centurion Mark Vs. The following morning, the 3rd Infantry Brigade and the 37th Armored Brigade 
met with the 55th Paratrooper Brigade near the town of Butmia, over 100 kilometers from the Israeli border. At the end of the battle for the Golan Heights, the Israelis occupied all their objectives, but lost a total of 160 tanks and 127 soldiers. Although many of the tanks were recovered after the war and repaired, returning to service just a few months later, these losses are higher than the 122 tanks lost in the Sinai Offensive and 112 lost in the Jordan Offensive. On the Golan Heights, the M51s with their powerful 105mm cannons had no difficulty handling the Syrian T-34-85s and the last Panzer IVs. In the short-medium range battles, they managed to keep up with the more modern Jordanian M47s and M48 patterns of US production and the Syrian and Egyptian T-54 and T-55. By June 10th, Israel had completed its final offensive in the Golan Heights, and a ceasefire was signed the day after. Israel had seized the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank of the Jordan River, including East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights, adding strategic depth and protection from its adversaries, and causing a lot of geopolitical problems that endure to this day. On October 6, 1973, at the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War, the Israelis were caught unprepared by the Syrian and Egyptian attack. They deployed all the reserves available to them, including 341 M50 Mark II and M51 tanks. The war began when the Arab coalition of Egypt and Syria launched a joint surprise attack on Israeli positions on Yom Kippur, a widely observed day of rest, fasting, and prayer in Judaism. Egyptian and Syrian forces crossed the ceasefire lines to enter the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights, respectively. Egypt's initial war objective was to use its military to seize a foothold on the east bank of the Suez Canal, and use this to negotiate the return of the rest of the Sinai, lost during the previous Six-Day War. Both the United States and the Soviet Union initiated massive resupply efforts to their respective allies during the war, and these efforts led to a near confrontation between the two nuclear superpowers. During the first hours of the war, <clears throat> during the first hours of the war, the Syrians had occupied a part of the Golan Heights. Therefore, the Israeli High Command had to mobilize all the reserves and, in just 15 hours, all vehicles and men available were sent to the front in a desperate race against time to stop the invaders. Many crews were assigned to armored vehicles on which they had not been trained. Some M51 crews had to mount the secondary armament during the march or refuel at civilian fuel pumps, as they did not receive enough fuel supply in the military bases. Other Shermans went into battle without having aligned their cannon optics. In the Sinai Desert, the Egyptians, after disembarking on the eastern bank of the Suez Canal, attacked the Israeli Barlev defensive lines. About 500 or 1,000 meters behind the defensive line were the positions of the Israeli tanks, which, due to the situation, numbered only about 290 along the whole front, of which only a few dozen were M50s and M51s. The Israeli tanks made a valuable contribution to the first hours of the war, but the Egyptians consolidated their positions and deployed 9 M14 Malyutka missiles, known under the NATO name of AT-3 Saga, which caused heavy Israeli tank losses. Information about the use of the Shermans in the Sinai campaign is quite scarce. About 220 M50s and M51s were employed in the battles against the Egyptians, with unsatisfactory results. The M51s had a marginal role. Their front armor was too light and, in the early days of battle, they became too easy a target for the Egyptian anti-tank missiles. An Israeli tank position behind the Barlev line, the most northerly in the Sinai Peninsula called Budapest, held up for the duration of the Egyptian assault. On the afternoon of October 6, an Egyptian unit consisting of 16 tanks, some jeeps armed with recoilless rifles and 16 APCs attacked Budapest. According to some sources, Budapest also had some M51s. The Israelis opened long-range fire, putting 8 APCs and 7 tanks out of action. After being surrounded by Egyptian commandos for 4 days, the Israelis continued to fight until short of ammunition. On October 10th, an Israeli supply column commanded by General Magan 
managed to reach it. The Israeli Shermans then took part in the Great Israeli Counteroffensive that began on October 14, 1973, shooting at long range against the Egyptian anti-tank missile positions. Here, the Shermans managed to provide support for the more powerful Shot and Magach tanks that were able to attack the Egyptian armored brigades, succeeding in destroying or knocking out 250 tanks in just one day for only 12 Israeli tank losses. In the Yom Kippur War, Israel was again victorious, but their initial losses in the Sinai demonstrated that the outstanding victory in the Six-Day War had created a sense of overconfident security. In the end, the effectiveness of the Israeli counterattack turned the tables in the war, putting Damascus and Cairo in danger. After the war, now fearing Egypt's military, Israel sought a peaceful solution to the conflict with its neighbor, paving the way to the historic Camp David Accords of 1978. In the Golan Heights sector, at the outbreak of the war, the Israelis could count on two armored brigades with a total of 177 shot cal tanks with 105mm L7 cannons in front of the Golan Heights. These faced off against a free Syrian armored division with a total of over 900 Soviet production tanks, mostly T-54s and T-55s, with a few old T-34-85s, Su-100s, and an unknown but limited number of modern T-62s. On October 6, a few hours after the start of the war, the 71st Battalion, made up of students and instructors from the IDF Armored School, a force of about 20 tanks, including some M50s and M51s, was sent to the front line. On October 7th, the Syrians attacked the positions held by the 77th OZ and the 71st Battalion, trying to circumvent Israeli defenses. After several hours of battle, in the afternoon, the Syrians were forced to desist from their intentions, withdrawing and leaving over 20 destroyed tanks on the battlefield. Around 2200 hours, the Syrian 7th Infantry Division and 3rd Armored Division, which had night vision equipment, and a part of the 81st Armored Brigade, which was equipped with a few powerful and modern T-62s armed with 115mm smoothbore cannons, attacked again. The Israelis, deploying a total of 40 tanks in fortified holdown positions without night vision devices, were able to withstand a wave consisting of 500 Syrian army tanks. During the second attack at 0400 hours, the Syrian commander, General Omar Abrash, was killed when his T-62 tank from where he commanded his troops was hit by an Israeli shell. The loss of the general slowed the offensive in that sector which only resumed on October 9th. Syrian tanks attacked the now exhausted Israeli soldiers of the 71st and 77th battalions of the 7th Armored Brigade. After several hours of fighting, the Israeli commander, Ben Gal, was left with only 7 tanks that had managed to shoot hundreds of rounds. Lieutenant Colonel Yossi Ben Hanan, who was in Greece at the outbreak of the war, arrived in Israel and rushed back to the Golan Heights, where, in a workshop in the rear of the battlefield, he found 13 tanks that had been damaged during the fighting in the previous days, including a couple of Shermans. He quickly assembled as many crews as he could, volunteers, often injured, and even some soldiers who ran away from the hospitals in order to fight, to command of this hastily improvised vehicle company and moved to the front line to support the 7th Armored Brigade. When they reached the 7th surviving tanks, they counter-attacked, hitting the left flank of the Syrian army, destroying another 30 Syrian tanks. The Syrian commander, believing that the 20 tanks of Ben Hanan were the first vehicles of the Israeli reserves, gave the order to withdraw from the battlefield. After 50 hours of battle and almost 80 hours without sleep, the survivors of the 71st and 77th battalions, which claimed to have destroyed 260 tanks and around 500 other vehicles, finally managed to rest. The real Israeli reserves were already on their way to the front, and it did not take them long to get there. During the night between 6th and 7th October, many Israeli tanks arrived on the heights. They were mostly without orders due to the death of many officers. They began to fight according to the initiatives taken by the tank commanders. The last actions of the Shermans were to take shots from short and medium distances against the Syrian armored vehicles that attempted a last desperate counterattack.
After the war, the surviving M51s were gradually removed from service and put in the reserve. Most were sold to Chile. A scant handful were sent to Lebanon to support the Christian militias. A small number were modified and used for testing, while the rest remained in the IDF reserve until the early 1990s, when they were completely withdrawn from service and scrapped. Now, in 1979, Chile, which was in good relations with Israel, bought 118 second-hand M51s to improve its armored core. Arriving by ship a year later, these were all of the fourth version, armed with the Browning M2HB 12.7mm over the main gun, Browning M1919 for the commander, and the 60mm mortars. The Chileans called them the M51 burritos, little donkeys in Spanish. They removed the machine guns and the mortars. The Brownings over the cannon barrel were reinstalled in the classic anti-aircraft position on the M79 mount near the commander's cupola. Another modification was the installation, in the free space previously occupied by the whole machine gunner, of a fridge for the drinking water for the crew. The Chilean M51s were intended to be used in the Atacama, the driest place on Earth. In 1983, these M51s were accompanied by 65 M50s armed with the 60mm hypervelocity medium support cannon. Between late 1994 and February 1998, 100 Chilean M51s were upgraded, installing a new transmission, the new Detroit 8 V71T turbo diesel 360 horsepower engine, and an improved exhaust system mounted on the left engine deck side. The suspension and optical systems were refurbished, removing the old US-built optics. The first 12 units were ready in February 1995 and are recognizable by the absence of the coaxial machine guns. These vehicles were considered by the Chilean army to be inferior to the M50s armed with the 60mm cannon. In fact, the 105mm cannons of the M51 had anti-tank characteristics inferior to the modern hypervelocity 60mm. The Chilean M51s were therefore relegated to second-line duties or as infantry support vehicles, with their powerful high-explosive rounds, as well as for clearing minefields using KTM-5 anti-mine devices, captured by Israel during the Yom Kippur War and later sold to Chile. All of the M51s were taken out of service until 2006, being replaced by hundreds of second-hand Leopard 1V tanks. Some were preserved as monuments on various bases or in museums, but most of the surviving vehicles were relegated to target ranges in the Atacama Desert. On April 13, 1975, a civil war broke out in Lebanon because of internal problems between Muslim Lebanese and Christian Lebanese. In the conflict that lasted 15 years, the Christian militias were supported by Israel and the Muslim militias were supported by Syria. Israel supported the Christian militias to avoid the Islamization of the country, which had been ruled by Christians until then, while Syria wanted to bring Lebanon under its military and cultural influence. In support of the Lebanese Christians, Israel supplied 75 M50 tanks and an unspecified number of 100mm armed Tirans, M3 half-tracks and M113 APCs. The militia that benefited most from these supplies was the South Lebanese Army which received a total of 35 M50 tanks that, in some cases, were repainted in different blue shades. In 2000, nearly 10 years after the end of the civil war, the South Lebanese army disbanded, and the surviving M50s were returned to Israel to prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. In 2017, in the second edition of the book Israeli Sherman, the author Tom Gannon reported an interesting discovery. One of the two M51s exposed in the Armored Corps Memorial Museum at La Truen had, in some places such as the inside of the telephone box and canvas mantled covers, been painted in a light shade of blue, similar to that used by the South Lebanese Army. By author Tom Gannon's estimation, based on his own knowledge, at least six M51s were sent to Lebanon during the Civil War years in the 1970s and in 2000, four of them were returned to Israel with the dissolution of the South Lebanese army. The IDF then repainted them in the usual Israeli camo and put them in depots, with at least one of these ending up in the Latrun Museum. Information on the South Lebanese army M51s is almost non-existent, 
and remained something of a secret until 2017. An intelligence document from the Spanish army dating from November 1982 examines the modifications and modernization of existing armored vehicles then being proposed for the foreign market and export sales. Among the numerous proposals detailed in the document, including for more modern vehicles such as the M48, M60 and Leopard 1, an interesting proposal by the Israeli Nimda company is mentioned. The Israeli company, a subsidiary of the Israeli military industry, was planning to upgrade the M50 and probably also the M51 with the installation of a new 360 horsepower Detroit diesel V8 Model 71T engine connected to a transmission system with mechanical clutch or to an Allison TC570 torque converter with modified gearbox. After the conversion, the tanks would have a top speed of 40 km per hour and a range of 320 km with the standard two 303 liter tanks left. The new power pack also included dust filters and an improved cooling system that could be housed in the existing engine compartment without any structural modifications. In addition, the company also proposed to upgrade the armament, replacing the D1508 cannons with CN7550 cannons, reboard from 75 to 90 mm caliber. This new gun would likely have similar anti-tank performance and characteristics to the French-made CN90F3 90mm cannon, the same mounted on the AMX3090. With a potential muzzle velocity of around 900 meters per second, it would likely have fired existing French 90mm ammunition already in Israeli use, such as the rounds for the Giat D921 cannon of the Panad AML armored car. That means 90mm high explosive and high explosive anti-tank ammunition that could penetrate about 300mm of armor. This project was most likely proposed to Chile in 1983, where they opted to mount the IMI 60mm hypervelocity medium support cannon, which was more effective in anti-tank combat on the M50, and not to modify the M51s because the 90mm high explosive rounds were less effective in the infantry support roles than the 105mm rounds. In the early 1950s, the IDF tested the Sinai Grey color on some M3 Shermans which was then accepted into service shortly before the crisis in the Suez in the early 1960s. All the M51s were painted in the new Sinai Grey, which, however, as can be seen in many color photos of the time, had many shades. Armored brigades stationed in the south on the border with Egypt had a yellowish shade of Sinai Grey for use in Sinai, while vehicles on the Golan Heights and on the borders with Jordan, Syria and Lebanon had a darker or brownish color. Obviously, over the years, these vehicles were different shades mixed with the various Israeli armored units or were repainted with another shade. The markings painted on the M51s were introduced by the IDF in the 1960s and although they may seem randomly painted, they identified the vehicle within its unit. On some vehicles, a symbol identifying the armored brigade to which the tank belonged was painted. The white stripes on the cannon barrel identify which battalion the tank belongs to. If the tank belonged to the 1st battalion, it had one stripe on the barrel, if it was the 2nd battalion, it had two stripes, and so on. The company the tank belonged to was determined by a white chevron, a white V-shaped symbol painted on the sides of the vehicle, sometimes with a black outline. If the M51 belonged to the 1st company, the chevron was pointing downwards. If the tank belonged to the second company, the V was pointing forward. Uh, if it was pointing upwards, the vehicle belonged to the third company, and if it pointed backwards, it belonged to the fourth company. The company identification markings had different sizes according to the space a tank had on its side. The M48 pattern had these symbols painted on the turret and were quite big, while the Centurion had them painted on the side skirts. The Shermans had little space on the sides and therefore the company identification markings were painted on the side boxes or in some cases on the sides of the gun mantlet. The platoon identification markings were written on the turret and were divided in two, an Arabic number from 1 to 4 and one of the first four letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel and Dalet. The Arabian number indicates the platoon to which a tank belongs to and the letter the tank number inside each platoon. Tank number 1 of the first platoon would have painted on the turret the symbol 1 Aleph, tank number 2 of the third platoon would have painted on the turret the symbol 3 
Tank number two of the third platoon would have painted on the turret the symbol free bet and so on. The platoon's command tank only had the Arabian number without the letter. Gimel with no number is the company commander and Dalit is his second in command. Gimel with the number 10 was the battalion commander and 11 was the second in command. Gimel with the number 10 was the battalion commander with 11 being the second in command. 20 Gimel was the brigade commander and 21 was his second in command. In pictures of the M50s, these symbols are not always visible, as pictures taken during the Yom Kippur War in 1973 show many M51s that had already been withdrawn from operational service, repainted and kept in reserve. On some photos taken before the standardization of the system of markings, three white arrows can be seen on the sides of the vehicles in service in the Sinai, the markings of Israeli Southern Command. Others also had a number painted on the front that identified the weight of the vehicle. This was done to indicate if the tank was able to cross certain bridges or for transportation on trailers. The number was painted in white inside a blue circle surrounded by another red ring. Crews sometimes painted the brigade insignia on the front and rear fenders, sometimes also indicating the battalion number. In some cases, not very often, the battalion insignia was painted on the right rear fender and the brigade insignia was moved to the right end of the fender. As mentioned, some of the M51s were delivered to the South Lebanon Army, which repainted them in blue. It is likely that like the M50s painted in blue by the Lebanese, the M51s also received the symbol of the South Lebanese Army, a hand holding a sword from which cedar branches come out, the symbol of Lebanon, in a blue circle painted on the frontal glacis. The 85 M51s Chile received arrived in Sinai Great Camouflage. The Chilean army greatly appreciated the camouflage because in the Atacama Desert where Chilean crews were training it was very useful because of the low infrared signature. After a short time however they decided to switch to other paints because the dust and salt were affecting the Israeli paint. There wasn't a single camouflage scheme that was decided upon for the entire army but it was for the local commanders to choose the schemes and buy the paints. Many of the camouflage schemes remain a mystery, but there is information about those used by the Grupo Blindado Número 9 Vencedores of the Brigada Corazato Número 1 Coracheros used in northern Chile. This unit painted its M51s and some of its M50s in a light sand yellow color and others in gray. In the end, in 1991, all the Shermans of the Brigada Corazada were repainted in light sand yellow. The Sherman nickname given by the Second World War crews to their medium tank M4s, which has since entered the common language of video games, films or military enthusiasts, was never used officially by the IDF. The IDF always called their M4 medium tanks after the name of its main gun. M3 for all the Shermans armed with the 75mm M3 cannon, M4 for all the Shermans armed with a 105mm M4 howitzer and so on. For the M51, however, a new system of naming major Israeli modifications was introduced that superseded the earlier Sherman naming convention. Since even the M50 was still named after its armament, the M51 was named as such to denote it being the next major variant in Israeli service after the M50. This system would appear again several decades later following the introduction of the Magach 7. The first major Israeli upgrade of foreign supplied Magach 6 tanks. The nickname Super was actually only used for Sherman versions armed with 76mm cannons which remained in service until 1968-1969, in honor of being the only version at the time capable of facing the T-34-85. These were the only vehicles to receive this nickname from the IDF. The other nickname, I Sherman, was never used by the Israeli army to indicate any vehicle on the Sherman chassis and is a wrong term used by the media, video games and model kit manufacturers. The M51 was born as a vehicle of necessity for the Israeli army, which needed to take already obsolete Shermans armed with 76mm guns and upgun them with powerful French cannons to create a new and capable tank as quickly as possible. While excellent against existing threats at the time it was created by the early 1970s advances in battlefield technology, 
including the prolific use of man-portable anti-tank missiles, when the M51's days in Israeli service were numbered. Despite no longer being effective in Israel, the M51 did find a new, albeit brief, lease of life in Chile, where it was given a new engine and used much as it was in Israel, two decades before, to help keep Chile safe until more modern vehicles could be acquired. To this end, it proved to be invaluable and demonstrated not only the versatility and adaptability of the Sherman chassis, but also of Israeli and French ingenuity at keeping a completely outdated vehicle relevant and viable for decades after its original service. That's all for this video. Make sure to follow our website, we'll be releasing new articles on the regular. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or Reddit and if you use Discord there's a link to our community server in the description. Also likes, comments and subscriptions on YouTube are greatly appreciated. If you would like to help us continue to develop and expand also consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. All of the funds will be used to help us enhance and design new articles and features for you. Until next time, keep us in your sights.